Hello, my name is Aline Burdett, and I am an interventional radiologist at the Penn State Hershey Medical Center. Today, I will be discussing the field of interventional radiology, including describing what IR is about, some common IR procedures, and how you, as a pre-medical student, can get involved in the field. I would like to thank the medical student team for putting together this presentation and inviting me to speak about the field. Without further ado, let's get started. First, let's define interventional radiology. Originally a subspecialty of radiology, IR was officially recognized as its own specialty by the American Board of Medical Specialties in 2012. In IR, procedures that are minimally invasive are performed under image guidance. These procedures are similar to those in surgery, but don't require large open cuts. In many of these procedures, needles are first poked through the skin to access a vein or artery. Special wires and catheters are navigated through the blood vessels to reach an area of interest and the appropriate treatment is given. For example, GI bleeds, tumors, and clots in blood vessels can be treated in this manner. By only having a small skin incision, the patient can go home with only a Band-Aid. Imaging modalities we use include X-ray, ultrasound, CT, and MRI. The devices discussed in the slide are just a preview of the tools used in IR. Balloons, stents, grafts, and thrombectomy devices can be used to open up narrowed or blocked vessels. Biopsy devices can be used to take samples of potential tumors. Meanwhile, embolic materials such as coils, plugs, and beads can be used to block blood flow in cases like bleeding. Some beads can be mixed with radioactive material or chemotherapy drugs to treat cancer, or we can use special needles to burn or freeze tumors as well. These devices offer a glimpse into the large array of tools IRs use daily, while the market for innovation and creativity and development of these devices continues to expand rapidly. So, how do IR procedures benefit patients? The majority of procedures require small incisions only a few millimeters in length. In contrast to traditionally larger incisions made in surgical procedures, infection and bleeding risks are minimized. Local anesthetic and mild sedation also prevent complications of general anesthesia. With these benefits, IR is able to minimize complications, improve patient outcomes, and decrease length of patient hospital stays. Furthermore, sicker patients who cannot tolerate traditional surgeries can safely undergo IR procedures. IR performs procedures covering virtually every organ in the body. In this presentation, we will be learning about some of the common procedures that IR does, as well as discussing real cases for these procedures. In particular, IR does cases on the vascular system, such as placing filters that prevent clots from reaching the lungs, treating malformations of the vascular system, and curing aneurysms of the aorta. In the gastrointestinal system, IR can remove gallstones and treat bleeds. From a neuro standpoint, IR can treat strokes, brain aneurysm, and fractures of the spine. IR can also treat cancer by freezing or burning tumors or injecting drugs that can destroy the tumors. Finally, IR can treat uterine fibroids or enlarged prostate glands. One major area of the body where IR physicians do procedures is in the blood vessels. These vascular procedures include the placement of inferior vena cava, or IVC filters, which act as sieves to prevent blood clots from the legs from entering the heart and lungs. IR also helps treat vascular malformations in children. Various abnormalities in the aorta, the artery coming off the heart delivering blood to the body, can be treated by IR. IR doctors also help treat peripheral arterial disease to ensure adequate blood flow to the legs to prevent leg pain, tissue infection, and the need for amputation. Lastly, diseases of the veins, such as varicose veins, can be treated with IR techniques. The first case we'll discuss is the placement of IVC filters, which are used in patients who have recurrent blood clot formation in their legs. These clots may get dislodged and enter the lungs, known as pulmonary embolism, which could lead to death. In terms of the anatomy, the veins in the legs come together to form the IVC, a large vein that drains blood directly into the heart, which then directly enters the lungs. An IVC filter, as it sounds, is a filter placed in the IVC that acts as a sieve for blood moving up towards the heart. A blood clot that gets dislodged from the legs is unable to cross the filter and therefore not get into the heart. 
These filters can often measure around 30 millimeters, but are placed through incisions in the skin that are only five millimeters large and then opened in the IVC like an umbrella. This is a case of a 76-year-old patient who came to the emergency room after having pain and swelling in his right leg. Ultrasound showed that he had clots in his leg veins. Normally, the patient would be given blood thinners to get rid of the clot. However, the patient recently had a brain bleed that resulted in a stroke. Since blood thinners could cause rebleeding in the brain, these would not be a good choice for treatment for the patient's clots. Therefore, the patient was given an IVC filter to prevent a pulmonary embolism. In the image here, you can see the filter deployed inside the IVC. A common pediatric procedure offered by IR is treatment of vascular malformations. These abnormal connections between arteries and veins, known as arteriovenous malformations or AVMs, are often present from birth. Normally, a capillary bed connects arteries and veins, but in an AVM, the high pressure artery is directly connected to the low pressure vein. AVMs in the skin can cause pain, swelling, skin discoloration, or bleeding. If the AVM is in the lungs, patients are at risk for stroke from a clot going through the AVM and into the brain, or problems breathing and getting enough oxygen. In the brain, AVMs can bleed and cause headaches or even death if the bleed is large enough. So, how are AVMs fixed by IR? Like most IR procedures, a needle is used to access a blood vessel in the neck or groin. Then a wire and catheter are guided through this incision to the area of the malformation. The malformation is blocked off or embolized using various materials to stop flow to the malformation, reducing the patient's symptoms. This image here, this image is a pulmonary angiogram or a mapping of the arteries going from the heart into the lung. You can see multiple areas with abnormal dilation of the vessels, which represent AVMs. This is a real example of an arteriovenous malformation in the lung of a 12-year-old boy. He presented with the flu and subsequently got a chest x-ray and CT shown on the left. An abnormality was seen arising from arteries branching out of the heart, thus confirming an AVM. To treat this AVM, a catheter and wire were advanced through a vein in the neck, through the right side of the heart, and into the arteries coming from the heart into the lungs, called the pulmonary arteries. Contrast was delivered through the catheter and highlighted branches coming off the pulmonary arteries. The AVM was seen as an enlargement of the normal vessels. So the catheter and wire were advanced further to select the pulmonary artery supplying the AVM. Metal coils were deployed in the inflow of the AVM, successfully stopping the flow through the AVM. This can be seen in the rightmost image in which contrast no longer fills the AVM. This simple procedure through a small incision in the patient's skin reduced this boy's breathing difficulty and his future risk of stroke. The patient was discharged soon after the procedure and was completely healthy at the time of follow-up. Another procedure IR does is fixing aneurysms, which are outpouchings of blood vessels that occur when the walls of the vessels are weakened. The pressure inside the blood vessel is able to push that weak part of the wall outward. Think of it like a water balloon. The walls of this balloon become thinner and weaker the more the vessel is dilated and stretched. If left untreated, an aneurysm can rupture and cause potentially fatal blood loss. One major artery that can be affected is the aorta. Aortic aneurysms are often asymptomatic, but when they rupture, the patient can die within minutes due to rapid internal bleeding. An endovascular aneurysm repair, or EVAR, can be used to treat these aneurysms, which were previously treated by open surgeries. In this procedure, an endograft is placed across the aneurysm such that blood flows through the endograft without putting pressure on the aortic wall. This way, the aorta no longer continues to grow and the likelihood of rupture decreases drastically. Here is an example of a basic EVAR of a 5.4 centimeter diameter aneurysm. For perspective, a normal aorta should be less than 3 centimeters. On the left image, you can see an x-ray with contrast dye injected to visualize the blood flow flowing through the aorta. The outpouching that can be seen indicates the presence of an aortic aneurysm. After an EVAR procedure in which an endograft was placed at the aneurysm site, blood flows entirely through the graft without putting pressure on the weakened walls. The image on the right shows that the dilation of the aorta is no longer present. Once this life-saving procedure was completed, the patient was left essentially with two band-aids on their groin. No big incision. 
In addition to treatments of the vascular system, IR also treats pathologies of the gastrointestinal system. For example, IR can be used to remove gallstones, treat bleeds in the GI system, and insert feeding tubes that go through the skin and into the stomach. Lack of blood flow to the GI system causing abdominal pain, called mesenteric ischemia, can also be treated by IR. The first GI case we will discuss is a gallstone removal. Bile is a dark green or yellowish fluid that aids in digestion and is stored within the gallbladder, a small sac located beneath the liver. If stored for too long, bile may precipitate into stones. Occasionally, these stones may become trapped in the small duct from the gallbladder to the small intestine, resulting in inflammation that may persist to serious infection or even death. Traditionally, the gallbladder is surgically removed in patients with symptomatic gallstones. However, for patients who may be too ill for surgery, IR can utilize a minimally invasive approach to place a drain to decompress the gallbladder or even manually remove the stones. To remove the gallstones, a tube is first inserted through the skin to access the gallbladder. A balloon is inflated in the tract leading to the gallbladder to make the tract wider. Stones within the gallbladder can then be suctioned out and physically extracted. Devices that use ultrasound waves, called lithotripsy devices, can be used to break large stones into smaller ones so that they can be removed more easily. The image above was obtained from a real case of a patient requiring cholecystoscopy. On the left, we can see contrast dye being injected through the tube that had been directed to the gallbladder. Under normal circumstances, the contrast dye should fill the gallbladder cavity uniformly. This patient has numerous stones within the gallbladder which show up as small circles of uneven filling, creating a web-like appearance of the gallbladder. The balloon that is inflated to dilate the tract can be seen in the next image. More than 50 stones were removed from the patient described in the case above. The next case we will be discussing is embolization to stop GI bleed. The gastrointestinal tract is a common source of internal bleeding. It is often clinically diagnosed by the presence of blood in the stool, coughing up blood, unexpected decline in blood pressure, or hematocrit. Interventional radiology can be used in the management of GI bleeds by performing coil embolization of the bleeding artery. In this procedure, a small catheter the size of a spaghetti noodle is threaded through the arteries toward the suspected site of bleeding. Contrast is injected to verify the bleeding vessel. Once this site has been identified, metal coils are inserted into the artery to occlude the vessel and stop the bleeding. This is a case of a 78-year-old patient who presented with blood in his stool. For this patient, we entered the arterial system through a groin artery. We directed a catheter into the blood vessel supplying his large intestines. We injected some contrast dye in these vessels, and some of the contrast flowed from the artery into the large bowel, indicating the presence of an arterial bleed. This can be seen in the image on the left. To treat this patient, we inserted metal coils in the blood vessel supplying that area and blocked flow to the site of bleeding. The image on the right shows the contrast no longer entering the bowel and remaining within the blood vessels, indicating the bleeding has stopped. IR also performs procedures related to the nervous system. Interventional neuroradiologists use the same techniques to solve problems in the vasculature in the brain, working on problems like strokes, brain aneurysms, blockages in major blood vessels, and vascular malformations. IRs commonly treat strokes. In patients without stroke, carotid arteries carry blood from the aorta to the brain without any problems. But in one type of stroke, one or more of these vessels becomes clogged, causing the brain to lose a portion of its blood supply and oxygen. The blockage of the carotid arteries is called carotid artery stenosis. When this happens, the brain cannot perform its normal functions, and patients can experience a decline in their functions, such as in walking, talking, and eating. To treat these strokes, the clots can be removed and flow restored by either taking out the clot or injecting a clot-busting drug directly into the site of the clot. This CT perfusion study shows a brain of a patient who had a severe carotid artery stenosis. The red areas signify the regions of the brain that are not receiving adequate blood supply. Here we have a 35-year-old male who recently underwent a right knee replacement. He then lost consciousness while doing physical therapy two days after his operation. 
He was taken to imaging and shown to have ischemia in the cerebellum, the part of the brain that controls balance. Interventional neuroradiology found a large clot blocking 100% of the blood flow from the vertebral artery, which supplies blood to the cerebellum. The clot was removed by IR and the patient's blood flow returned. The patient returned home three days after this event and had no clinically relevant decrease in movement, speaking, balance, or cognitive function. Neuro-IR also treats brain aneurysms. These occur when arteries in the brain become weak and begin to balloon or bulge outward. These aneurysms can rupture and bleed, which can cause life-threatening strokes, known as hemorrhagic strokes. In order to treat these, metal coils are placed through the arterial system into the aneurysmal sac to cause the blood flow in the sac to clot, so that blood no longer flows into the aneurysm. This reduces or eliminates the risk of rupture and bleeding. Here, we have a 50-year-old female who presented to the ED with the worst headache of her life. The CT of her head showed a large bleed in her brain due to an aneurysm. The arrow on the first image points to the aneurysm, which measured 1.7 millimeters. The interventional neuroradiologist advanced a catheter into the bleeding artery and a microcoil was placed in the aneurysm as seen on the next image. The patient's bleeding stopped and she recovered neurologically and was released from the hospital two weeks later. The final image sh shows the aneurysm before and after the procedure. As you can see, the microcoil fixed the aneurysm. Another service IR can provide for patients is relief of chronic and severe pain, for example, due to unresectable cancer or trauma. Image-guided steroid injections can be used to reduce inflammation and provide relief from back or joint pain. If a patient's pain doesn't respond to these injections, more permanent and drastic measures may be taken, such as severing nerve roots, i.e. rhizotomy, or injecting alcohol into nerve bundles, i.e. plexus block. Here we will discuss a case of kyphoplasty, which is used to fix fractures in the spine. These fractures can be caused by osteoporosis, trauma, or cancer, which weaken the bone. The fractures can cause abnormal curving of the spine and pain so severe that patients can't even get out of bed. IR can do a procedure called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty in which cement is injected through a needle into the fractured vertebra. The spine jack device works like a tire jack to restore height to the vertebra, and cement is injected around it to stabilize the vertebra in this position. The spine jack is then left inside the vertebra. Patients often report immediate alleviation of pain following this procedure. The patient in this case was an elderly woman with osteoporosis who had sudden severe back pain after carrying heavy boxes, a very common story for vertebral fractures. The image farthest on the left is an MRI showing a new severe fracture in one of the vertebral bodies. The middle image is a close-up of the spine jack expansion, with the final image showing the spine jack and cement left inside the vertebra at the end of the procedure. This patient reported immediate relief from the pain that previously left her bedridden. IR has also become part of the cancer treatment team. IR can shrink and eradicate certain types of tumors by burning or freezing them with a needle. These tumors can also be destroyed by injecting chemotherapy drugs or radioactive particles through blood vessels supplying these tumors. The first procedure we will discuss is burning or freezing a tumor known as an ablation. This is most often done for tumors in the kidney and liver and in patients that are not candidates for surgery or have recurring tumors despite surgical resection. In an ablation procedure, a needle is first placed through the skin and into the tumor under image guidance. Further, care must be taken to avoid hitting critical structures such as the intestines or lungs. Once inside, the needle is heated or cooled to extreme temperatures, which in turn destroys the tumor. In this case, we have a 50-year-old female with history of stroke and heart attack who underwent a CT scan of her abdomen for suspected adrenal problems and was found to have a malignant tumor in her kidney. The patient had too many risk factors to undergo surgery, so she was selected for ablation. The procedure was a success and she had no complications. Months later, the tumor no longer lit up on the CT scan, meaning that it was successfully treated. While ablation cases use a heated needle to destroy a tumor, the blood supply to a tumor can also be used to treat these cancers in a procedure known as transarterial chemoembolization or TACE. 
Tumors have an increased concentration of arteries supplying their growth from the hepatic artery in the liver. In taste procedures, beads coated with chemotherapy drugs are injected directly to the tumor through these blood vessels. These beads clog the vessel and release the drug, ultimately causing the tumors to shrink and sparing the rest of the body of the side effects of traditional chemotherapy treatment. Here we have a case of a 69-year-old female who survived the Khmer Rouge and Cambodian genocide, presenting with an 8-centimeter liver tumor. Because her case was so severe, the patient was put on hospice care, estimated to live under six months. The patient came to Kaiser Permanente in Los Angeles with her only son who begged for her life. She received Taze. Instead of six months, she got six years. In the left image, contrast agents highlighted a significant blood supply to the tumor. The CT scans on the right show that the tumor was eliminated soon after the procedure. Interventional radiology is also very active in medicine that is specific to men's and women's health. For example, IRs can help treat fibroids, endometriosis, pelvic pain, and infertility in women. For men, IRs can also help treat infertility in addition to prostate enlargement. One procedure offered by IR is uterine fibroid embolization, also known as UFE. This procedure can be offered to women with symptomatic fibroids, which are abnormal growths of the muscle of the uterus. Women with significant pain or bleeding from their fibroids may choose to undergo a UFE as a minimally invasive procedure to treat their symptoms. The procedure is done by accessing an artery supplying the uterus, then injecting small particles to block off or embolize the uterine artery. Women may go home the same day or may be kept overnight for pain control as the fibroids die off and then go home the next day with only a band-aid. This patient was a 48-year-old woman who had very painful and heavy periods with bleeding between her periods and constant pelvic pain and pressure. She wanted to preserve her fertility, so she did not want to have her uterus removed. She decided to have a UFE. On the left, you can see an MR image of her uterus before the procedure. You can see that there is a large fibroid that is lighting up with contrast delivery, meaning that it is actively receiving blood and causing her symptoms as well as potentially growing. Then in the middle, you can see an image from her procedure. The radial artery in her left wrist was accessed and a catheter and wire were advanced into the uterine artery. Then in the middle, you can see an image from her procedure. The radial artery in her left wrist was accessed and a catheter and wire were advanced into the uterine artery, which you can see labeled on the image. The artery is blocked off using tiny beads, eliminating blood flow to the fibroid. The patient left the next day with only a band-aid on her left wrist. On the right, you can see the follow-up MRI, which shows the same fibroid, but now it is smaller and not lighting up because it is dying from lack of blood flow. At her follow-up visit, the patient had significant improvement in her pain and bleeding symptoms, all achieved through a tiny nick in the skin on her left wrist. Benign prostate hyperplasia, or BPH, is a problem of an enlarged prostate, usually in older men, causing lower urinary tract symptoms, such as draining to urinate and continual dribbling. These symptoms occur because the prostate is crowding around the urethra and preventing an adequate stream of urine from exiting the bladder. By making the prostate smaller, by reducing the blood able to supply the growing prostate, we can reduce this external blockage of the urethra. A prostate artery embolization procedure is done by injecting occlusive substances into the artery supplying the prostate, stopping blood flow and depriving it of oxygen. Without oxygen, metabolism ceases and the prostate shrinks. This is a difficult procedure and the radiologist must figure out the correct artery or arteries to embolize during the procedure. Troubleshooting often is the most fun part of the operation. Here we have a case of a 70-year-old male with progressive urinary symptoms and an enlarged firm prostate. Behavior modification and medications did not improve his symptoms. The patient underwent prostate artery embolization in which the radiologist gained access to the blood vessels in the upper thigh, found the correct artery supplying the prostate, and injected agents to clog that artery supplying the prostate. The image on the left shows increased blood flow to the prostate that indicates an enlargement of the gland. After the procedure, the patient reported having a decrease in symptoms with increased urinary flow. 
The image on the right shows reduced blood flow to the prostate after the embolization. Now that you've seen some of the cases IR does, let's talk about reasons students may want to enter this field. If you enjoy procedures and a hands-on approach to problem solving, IR could be a good fit. If you are interested in technology and advancements in the medical field, you may be well suited for our IR because new devices are constantly being developed to treat IR patients. Also, interventional radiologists work in every organ system. If you are seeking the opportunity to treat a broad variety of conditions, IR could be for you. If you appreciate on-the-spot problem solving, IR has a lot to offer because no two procedures are alike. Anatomical variants, for example, require real-time reconsideration of your treatment approach. Also, IR retains the humanistic aspect of medicine as physicians follow and form relationships with patients in the office setting. Finally, IR physicians can be involved in a patient's care from diagnosis to treatment to follow-up. Certified in diagnostic radiology as well, IR doctors can read images, put together clinical histories to arrive at a diagnosis, and then use their procedural knowledge to treat the problem. As a pre-medical student, there are ways you can get involved in IR. First, you can shadow an interventional radiologist at your school's hospital. Keep your options open by shadowing physicians in other fields, but it always helps to get IR exposure early. Second, you can have your pre-medical chapter and society invite an interventional radiologist to give a presentation at your school. Third, you can attend regional symposia and conferences such as the annual Midwest Interventional Radiology Medical Student Symposium and the Northeast Regional VIR Symposium to make professional connections and gain a deeper understanding of the field. You can find more information on how to get involved on the Society for Interventional Radiology website, specifically the Residents, Fellows, and Students section. In summary, interventional radiology is a rapidly developing field in which minimally invasive techniques are used under image guidance to treat various conditions. These conditions include, but are not limited to pathologies of the vascular, GI, neurologic, and reproductive systems. Students interested in both procedures and patient interactions would make a good fit for IR. Those who are motivated to participate in lifelong learning would make excellent candidates. IR physicians come from myriad backgrounds, and the IR community welcomes everyone, no matter what your background, experiences, and interests are. With that, I would like to conclude our presentation on interventional radiology. I would like to thank all the interventional radiologists listed above who contributed cases to our presentation and the medical students who put it all together. Thank you.